Welcome to Economics 1723 Capital Markets. This is the lecture module for Lecture 6 on diversification. And then we're going to talk about mean variance analysis in the special case where we have only two risky assets. So the roadmap is first diversification, then mean variance analysis. Let's jump right in. Let's do a simple model to illustrate diversification. I'm going to assume that there are only two stocks to start with, two risky stocks, call them one and two, and they have the same expected return. So the return on the first stock is R bar plus a shock epsilon one. This is the risky component. And the return on stock two, R2, is again the same R bar plus another shock epsilon two. Now suppose these two random variables, epsilon one and epsilon two, have zero mean and they're uncorrelated with one another. So they have zero correlation, equivalently zero covariance. Let's also suppose to make life simple that epsilon and one and epsilon two have the same variance. I'm going to call that sigma squared idio. Idio is for idiosyncratic. So we're assuming here that the company's returns have only unique to that company or idiosyncratic risks. An example might be, you know, the company's CEO has a heart attack. That's independent of whatever might happen to some other company. And again, for simplicity, we're assuming that returns have the same mean and variance. Now, if you invest in either stock one or stock two, you get the expected return R bar and you get variance sigma squared idio. But what happens if you divide your wealth, you, you, you diversify it, or split your wealth equally between the two stocks? The portfolio return is now 1 half R1 plus 1 half R2. That's the average of the two returns. Well, the mean of that is still R bar, but you're going to get epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 over 2. You're going to get the average of the two shocks or risks. And the variance of that is going to be uh, one quarter times the variance of the sum, right? Because we've got a one half here, we square that for one quarter. One quarter times the variance of the sum, which is a one quarter times the variance of the first shock, plus twice the covariance between them, which is zero because they don't have a covariance, plus the variance of the second shock. So we're going to have one quarter times two times the variance. Sigma, this should be sigma squared idio. So that's going to be sigma squared idio divided by 2, the idiosyncratic variance divided by 2. So by diversifying equally, we have reduced the variance of the portfolio. We've cut it in half. Now, let's think about the case where there's more than two assets. Suppose we've got many such stocks. We've got n of them, and each of them has this same mean and an independent return, uncorrelated shocks across all the different stocks. If you split your wealth equally across all these stocks, you're going to end up getting the average of all uh, n returns. And that's going to give you the mean return plus the average of all these shocks, epsilon i. The mean return is again r bar. And the variance is the variance of this average, which is the sum of the idiosyncratic variances divided by n squared plus all the covariances or cross terms, which are zero because they're uncorrelated. So we've got n times sigma squared idio divided by n squared. That's sigma squared idio divided by n. So as n gets large, diversification is going to eliminate all of this idiosyncratic risk. Now, that may be a little bit too optimistic uh, about the power of diversification, because we've assumed unrealistically up to this point that shocks are purely idiosyncratic. So now let's think what happens if there are systematic risks that affect the returns of many assets at the same time. So to capture that, let's suppose that returns are given by this equation. The return on stock I is the common mean R bar plus a systematic shock, which is the same for every stock plus an idiosyncratic shock. Now, an example of a systematic risk would be the economy going into a recession, then all stocks will go down at the same time. We're going to assume that the systematic shock or risk is uncorrelated with all the idiosyncratic ones, and the variance of the systematic shock is sigma squared cis. 
All right, what does diversification do in this setting? Um, if you invest in only one stock, you'll get the variance of the systematic shock plus the variance of the idiosyncratic piece. That's the total variance sigma squared of a single stock. With diversification, on the other hand, you're going to get um, the average of all these RIs. That's the common mean R bar plus the systematic shock plus the average of the uh, unique idiosyncratic shocks. This has the variance of this plus this average, the systematic shock plus this average. That's the variance of the systematic shock plus the variance of the average of the idiosyncratic shocks. There's no covariance because these don't covary with each other. That is sigma squared cis plus sigma squared idio divided by n. Now as n gets large, the variance will approximate the systematic risk, the systematic variance. That is that cannot be eliminated through diversification. You're going to be stuck with that because it shows up in every stock. So it doesn't matter how you divide your wealth across the stocks, you're always left with this risk. So here's uh, Bode, Kane, and Marcus, figure 7.1, an illustration of portfolio standard deviation as a function of the number of stocks in the portfolio. In panel A, all the risk is idiosyncratic, so it goes away to zero like this. In panel B, some risk is systematic. They call it market risk. That's the piece that you can't eliminate. And the idiosyncratic piece is the piece that's going away. All right, so that was uh, a basic discussion of diversification. Now I want to talk more generally about um, how you combine assets when they may have different means and different variances. So they're not all the same. As, as the stocks were in the, the first part. We're going to allow them to be different, but to keep life simple for the moment, we're going to assume there are only two risky assets. All right, so we're going to be judging portfolio by its mean and its variance. That's what we care about. Uh, remember when we discussed portfolio choice, we argued that you could do this, that you could take a general utility function and, and work with mean and variance. Uh, so we're going to um, start with the case where we have two risky assets, R1 and R2. The means are R bar 1 and R bar 2. The variances are sigma squared 1, sigma squared 2, and the correlation rho 1, 2. This correlation was previously assumed to be 0. Now we'll allow for it. So the covariance then is the correlation times the product of the two standard deviations. This is just really true by the definition of correlation. Okay, so these are the assets you have available. Let's consider the risky portfolios that you can get by combining these assets. The portfolio return is W1R1 plus W2R2. Of course, W2 has to equal 1 minus W1. The weights have to add up to 1. The mean return is additive in the components. It's just you just take the weighted average of the R bars and you get the R bar P, the average return on the portfolio. The key point is that the variance is not linear. The variance of the portfolio is W1 squared times the first variance, sigma squared 1, plus W2 squared times the second variance, sigma squared 2, plus 2 W1, W2 times the covariance, or we could write it out in terms of the correlation if we like. So that's the variance. The standard deviation is the square root of this whole thing. You can see that this is not generally additive in the components. It's a nonlinear equation. This variance equation is a quadratic equation. In fact, um, when, um, when uh, uh, the portfolio weight W1 is between 0 and 1, so you're not shorting or using leverage, the previous equation implies that the portfolio variance is less than the square of this linear combination of standard deviations. Okay, so it's less than or equal to that and it'll only be equal to, to, to it if the correlation is 1. So when the correlation is less than 1, you're actually reducing variance by mixing the assets relative to what you would get if you had a linear combination of standard deviations. So this is once again the power of diversification. Any diversification strategy with positive weights has a lower standard deviation than the weighted average standard deviation. So let's do an example from Bode, Kane, and Marcus. Suppose there's 
stocks and bonds or debt. The mean return on stocks is 13%, the standard deviation is 20%, the mean return on debt is 8%, and the standard deviation is 12%, and let's say the correlation coefficient is 0.3. Now the mean return, here's the portfolio weight on the horizontal axis, the mean return, the expected return on the vertical axis, that's linear. Okay, we're just following a straight line. But if we look at the standard deviation and plot the standard deviation against the, uh, the weights, we see that in general we get a curve that bends down. We only have a straight line when rho equals 1. This is the case where diversification doesn't help you. We're just getting a weighted average of the standard deviations. But for any smaller correlation, the curve bends down between 0 and 1. The assumed value of rho equals 0.3 is this solid blue line. If rho is 0, we, we, we can go lower. And actually, if rho is minus 1, if the assets are perfectly negatively correlated, we can combine them with positive weights in such a way as to get a 0 risk. We can come all the way down here. But always, you see, the portfolio standard deviation is below the weighted average of the individual standard deviations when we have weights between 0 and 1. Now, um, to do the previous graph in a more analytical way, it's useful to start by characterizing the portfolio that has the minimum risk. All right? Suppose that all you wanted to do was minimize risk, combine risky assets to get the lowest risk. Uh, we're going to call this the global minimum variance portfolio, call it G, and the weights in G are WG1 and WG2, which is 1 minus WG1. All right, so let's start with the special case where the assets are perfectly correlated. All right, when, um, when rho 1, 2 equals 1, the largest possible correlation, then the quadratic equation um, is a perfect square that looks like this. And we can set this to 0 by choosing wg1 equal to minus sigma 2 over sigma 1 minus sigma 2. When rho 1, 2 is minus 1, the smallest possible correlation, then again the quadratic equation for variance is a perfect square, and we can set it to 0 by choosing wg1 now as sigma 2 divided by sigma 1 plus sigma 2. So in the first case we have a negative weight for, for asset 1, and in the second case uh, a positive weight, assu uh, assuming here that sigma 1 is greater. So if we go back to this figure, you can see that um, the, w the, this in the row equals 1 case, there's a straight line that goes off to the left, and we can hit the, the horizontal axis and get zero risk if we have a negative weight. All right. Um, uh, whereas um, in the row equals minus 1 case, we have positive weights for both assets, and we can get a zero standard deviation. And I've just now derived for you the formula for the weight that will do that for you. Okay, it's sigma 2 divided by sigma 1 plus sigma 2. Okay, so this, this uh, case of perfectly correlated assets is a very special one. These assets move in lockstep, lockstep. The return on one is a multiple of the return on the other, so all risk can be eliminated by holding the right combination of the two. Now, as a concept check, I'd like you to think about what this tells us about the average returns on the two assets. And... Um, let me give you a clue. Think about arbitrage, uh, arbitrage opportunities. All right, so I'm going to leave you to think about that rather than telling you the answer here online. Uh, let's proceed to the more general case of the global minimum variance portfolio when correlation is between minus 1 and plus 1. And then you can't lower the variance all the way to 0. In these cases, you get a general uh, condition, you're trying to minimize variance, and you're going to do that uh, with calculus. Set the derivative of sigma squared p with respect to w1 equal to 0. This is the first order condition. We just take the derivative of this with respect to w1, do the calculus. This is what we get. And here are the general solutions then. We, w1 is this, and w2, wg2 is this. These are completely general formulas, which do apply even when uh, correlations are, are perfect. 
Uh, there's a couple of other good special cases to know. When the two assets are uncorrelated with one another, then the minimum variance weights are inversely proportional to variance. Okay, so the weight on asset one is the variance of the other asset divided by the sum of the variances. So the riskier an asset is, the less weight you put on it. And then uh, a final point is that when the two variances are equal, as in our earlier simple example, then the global minimum the global minimum variance weights are just one half, one half. All right, and you can look back here if the if the variances are equal then the top line has to be one half the bottom line uh, no matter what the correlation is. Okay, so here's our pictorial summary portfolio weights and standard deviation. Here's the case rho, rho equals minus one, perfect negative correlation. Here's the minimum variance weight. Here's perfect correlation and there's the minimum variance weight. And in general, we've got somewhere something else in the middle. Now, finally, I want to move towards a so-called risk return diagram. So far, we've plotted portfolio weight against standard deviation. Uh, but what I want to do now is plot the mean return against the standard deviation, recalling that the mean is a linear function of the portfolio weight, while the variance is a quadratic function. That means that a plot of mean against variance is a parabola, and a plot of mean against standard deviation is a hyperbola. So now I'm plotting variance on the horizontal, mean return on the vertical. I have a parabola that's tilted sideways like this. And if I change the units of the horizontal axis from variance to standard deviation, that changes the parabola to a hyperbola. So I'm going to leave you there. We're going to develop these curves and uh, think about what happens with many risky assets, but we'll leave that for another day.